we are entering today into a session for non-tariff barriers. Now, what is the meaning of non-tariff barriers? Friends, as we all know, when I want to export my product, for example, to the US market, there may be many companies in the US supplying the same product to the US customers. Now, when you try to enter the US market, the, the export market share of these companies which are locally presenting the same product to the same consumer, you technically become a competitor against them. So any importing country would like to restrict the exports coming from a foreign market. Now, one way to do that was raising a very high level of import duty. Now, at every moment when you cannot have a very high barriers of trade, you the other way that you can restrict the imports coming into your market is to have very high non-tariff barriers. So technically speaking, friends, non-tariff barriers are the way you can protect entering a foreign country. So when I'm an exporting company, I need to understand what are the plethora of barriers that you as a company can face while entering into a global market. Because you may find the best of the buyers when you go to a trade fair, but if you do not allow yourself to enter the market, how will your payment get realized? So this particular session is apprising the participants on what all can hamper your exports into a foreign market. Import duties. What all can hamper your exports into a foreign market? Which is very important for us to answer these questions. That what makes your product uncompetitive beyond import duties. How many kinds of such barriers exist that a company should be aware in order to prepare himself venture into a global market? Do these barriers or so to say that we call as standards vary across import markets? Where can you find the information about the import regulations for your product across various global markets? And how can you ensure the protection against an export rejection for your product? And in a scenario where you've taken all the precautions, you understood the import regulations of that market, you understood what kind of standards are there in that market. Despite that, if you're facing an import retention, is there a way out for you to still manage a successful entry? Now, the products at the port may look absolutely the same. But the custom officials in the international market may not allow the entry of your product because they do not comply with your country's, with the country's regulatory or import standards. So when I am trying to close the circle in my business plan, it is very important to understand what all I need to take care as a company in order to have a successful entry into that market. So compliances can help Indian companies compete against the L1, L2 players. How do you think that? You need to be compliant with the buyer's requirement. And what are these kind of compliances? There are, if you're dealing with an agricultural product, where if you are not complying with the sanitary and phytosanitary certificate requirement, which we call it SPS, you your products may be detained. Maybe the products are not a good quality product which may create a, a disease in a particular market. So internationally, the consumers are quite aware about the quality of imports coming into their market and they are and the government is very, very cautious about the good quality products entering as a result of import duty reductions. Then if you're dealing into a non-agricultural product, then we have to take care about a lot of technical barriers to trade that we call as TBT compliances. Maybe you're selling a mobile phone. You need to work on the compliances related to the electronic sector. You are dealing with an, uh, an export of a two-wheeler from India to Brazil. Maybe the carbon dioxide emission norms, which we call environmental norms, may be different in Brazilian market as compared to what was there in the Indian market. So when you are trying to go global, you cannot push the same product that you are selling in your local companies as compared to what you're selling in the, because climatic conditions are different, the, the regulatory requirements are different, you need to be very cautious about the SPS and the TBT compliances. Then the certain countries are very particular 
about the ethical compliances. Certain countries are very particular, specifically if you are dealing into old product, old destination. Now, everybody is selling the same product on Alibaba, right? So, in the era of digital marketing, your company is selling exactly the same product that other Indian company or Chinese company are selling online. How do you encourage more footfalls on your product site as compared to the other? So, the brand story that you write against your product is all what you can have because you're not having a personal one-to-one -one sales strategy with your consumers. So all these compliances gives you an opportunity to write a beautiful brand story which makes you different than the other companies selling the digitally the same products where consumers just get to read a description about your product. So if you are a socially compliant company, if you are ethically compliant company, if you claim on your products that we are we are designed a product where we have shifted from an old product to a new product on the basis of an environmental compliant product that gives you an added edge and you are technologically compliant company so ethics social technology finance environmental all these compliance gives you an added beautiful story that can pull the crowd digitally on your platform and that's where you kick start getting more number of buying orders now what are these and where do you find these information? Now, let's talk about the quality compliance, which we talk about the SPS and TBT compliance. The SPS compliance basically talks about the quality of products that you are trying to trade with the international buyers. Now, when the import duties are coming down as a result of WTO negotiation, what is bothering that as a result of import duty negotiation, I am having more access to the markets of the developed economies. Now, the health standards of the developed economies may be very, very stringent as compared to the standards operating in your own domestic market. So you may be supplying a particular product in India. When you want to export that product to the U.S. market, you have to understand what are the specific sanitary regulations and the quality norms does my product need some kind of a change and stringency in terms of the certification, in terms of the auditing, in terms of sampling? What, does, what do I need to do as a company to enter a developed country market? Now, this was an example that, uh, that was there in order to explain how quality becomes a very important parameter. Now, your biggest L2 player, which was China in your dairy products, their products were banned for three months. I, as an Indian company, will not make the same mistake. So I'm doing my homework properly in order to understand the reasons of rejections. So these two reports are rapid alert system for food and feed, which is your agricultural companies. And we have RAPEX report, R-A-P-E-X. RAPEX report for the non-agricultural products or the manufacturing products. Now, taking the story forward, this could be the list of non-tariff barriers. Now, technical regulations. If you miss on certain technical regulations, your products can be detained at the foreign port. You are supposed to carry certain certifications like for meat products in the Middle Eastern market, you need to have some halal certifications. Now, uh, for agriculture products, you need some phytosanitary certifications that the product is good to eat. So there are certifications. If you do not have that certifications, your products will not be allowed to enter the foreign market. Then certain countries like India is having OGL, restricted, prohibited category, both for imports as exports. Every country has certain prohibited products. So if it is prohibited, you again cannot enter that market. So please check the list of certain products which are prohibited either to be exported from India or to be imported in a particular country. Then there are certain labeling norms where we will talk about where do you get this information in due course of time, but you have to be very, very particular about the labeling standards of different importing country. The packaging standards, countries are very particular about the packaging norms. Uh, for example, if I am a mango exporter to Japan, the Japanese customs have indicated even the pack of the size of the uh, packaging. They've also indicated the, the diameter of the holes 
so the typical packaging norms of the Japanese customs would indicate there has to be six holes in the packaging uh, so that the fruit inside is fresh during the transit. They've also mentioned not only the number of holes in the package, but also the diameter of the holes of the package. Now, if you are, if you miss reading these packaging labeling norms, you get to miss the market, which is very, very, which can be very, very uneconomical and unreliable for the Indian companies. Then you have to deal with specific food additives. If you're into a value-added goods, a processed product, you have to be very particular about food additives that you are mixing in that product. Then you have to be very cautious about the heavy metals uh, in the sense, uh, you know, Indian spinach have been found to have a high amount of nitrate where Dubai market also, to one extent, was rejecting Indian spinach, Indian bhindi, okras were being rejected. Indian groundnuts were rejected on the basis and spices were rejected on the basis of aflatoxin content that was found because that was one of the reasons for mycotoxins. Then contaminants. Uh, the product may be good, but the packaging material that you are using uh, to package and that's coming in contact with the food product, that may end up into a, a, a rejection due to contaminants of the packaging material. So you have to work at two levels. One, contaminants at a packaging level and contaminant in the product itself. Then there are veterinary residues. If you're dealing into a meat product or a poultry product, be very cautious about what has been fed to the, to the animal and what are the veterinary residues. Similarly, you have to be very cautious about the import standards of different countries on pesticide residues and the maximum residue, which we call technically as MRL uh, standards. So we have identification and marking. And finally, we have rules of origin that we'll also check in the RTA session. Now, what is the difference between an SPS barrier and a TBT barrier? Now, SPS, which technically stands for sanitary and phytosanitary measure, your products can be detained at the foreign port because your products are not found to be good to eat. So anything which can carry an edible product, which can carry a human or animal health from a foodborne risk, it can carry from an animal or a plant carried risk diseases. Then there is a pest or a disease. For example, food additives, as we said, or the pesticide residue. Indian mangoes were detained at the foreign port because of the fruit fly infestations. Alfonso mangoes at one point of time were rejected in the European market, which was our typical old destination and a beautiful business used to happen. But Alfonso mango was also detained because of the fruit fly residues that was found and that was because of the SPS measures. When we talk about technical barriers to trade, this means you have certain peripherals that the, we're not talking about the product, so to say, which is good to eat or bad to eat. We're talking about the processes, means packaging can result into a bad quality product. So these are the peripherals of keeping the product safe in terms of nutritional claims that companies would make, the packaging, the labeling standards, the pesticide, the way you're handling the pesticides, that's for the agricultural product. And also, for example, uh, if you're selling a car, the seed belts, the emission norms, all these comes under the technical barriers to trade. So that's the difference between the two prime kinds of barriers that comes into picture. One of the uh, standards that come into picture while talking about now, your question would be, how will you come to know which are the standards available across different countries? Now, you can visit that three organizations internationally that harmonize the international standards. So if you're looking for, a, you find a buyer in an African market and you're absolutely unclear about where to find information about the import standards or the SPS standards of that market, you have two choices. Either you can type in Google GAIN, which is Global Agri Information Network, plus the import regulations of that market. This report, which are available freely, can give you information about the packaging, labeling, nutritional claims, the additives, the mycotoxins, everything as a food law, the embassy connects that can help you enter into that market. 
So everything about the SPS norms can be available in about any market in the world through a gain report. You also have pre-organizations for food safety. The harmonization comes from codex standards. This is C-O-D-E-X. The codex standards at the codex alimentarius was a body formed by way back in 1960 by Food and Agricultural Organization and World Health Organization. Now these two bodies came together to harmonize the food safety standards across the globe. So in case you're supplying a product to a particular market and you do not find information even in the gain reports, you can you can choose to follow a codex standard which is supposed to be an international standard for that particular product. So which every country is expected to follow. If you're dealing into a uh, into a meat product where HS code 01, 02, 03, 04, and 16. So we have to follow OIE standards, which is the Animal Health Standard by OIE. If you're dealing into any plant product, you need to follow the standards, which is IPPC, International Plant Protection Convention. So these are three bodies which are responsible to harmonize the standards across the globe. If you are dealing into an agricultural exports, what is something which is mandatory and also for some of the non-agricultural products as well, we talk about the traceability standards. Now, if you are a supplier of, uh, of for example, a processed product, now you need to be very clear about what is the level of, of traceability that, that I can have as a certificate. It is, it is mandatory in the European and the Japanese market. And it is still voluntary in the U.S. and the Canadian market. But in times to come, the traceability will be something that will be actually demanded by many of these buying countries. So traceability is a system where an exporting company should be aware about the entire supply chain at a back end. Meaning if I am an exporter of a tomato juice to Argentina, I need to be very sure about the entire back end which is the farmer, which is the, which is the middleman, which is the bundi, and the entire chain of how these tomatoes have reached the place where you have bought it as a raw material, and then you can keep a control. So that's the requirement of a traceability that is very important. So the information on all these standards, mycotoxins, aflatoxins, and gain report is, is one source. You have International Portal on Food Safety, Animal and Plant Health, which we technically called as IPFSAPH.org. You can just do a beautiful search about what kind of SPS standards are available. They have commodity-wise information, geography-wide information, and cross-sectoral issues uh, working. And you can see all the kind of OIE standards, CODEX standards, WTO standards. Now comes the labeling standards. When you visit the GAIN report, you'll be very interesting. Now, let me give you an example of a Spanish market. Now, Spanish market is very, very typical in case of a labeling standard where they are very particular about the product stickers being maintained in a Spanish language, number one. And the tag must have expiry date, a lot number, the, S, the sanitary code, and something that is very typical of the Spanish market is labels containing words, pictures, graphic representations are not allowed. If you are dealing into a textile product, you have to be very cautious about Directive 208.121, which talks about that all textile products must carry a label which indicates the fiber content. And that is why you see Made in India is giving you a country of origin tag and 100% cotton. So these are two mandatory requirements for a textile labeling. And it has to be marked with proper percentages, 80% cotton, 5% this, 10% this. You need to be very, very cautious about having a sequential order for a textile labeling. Then you have a standard on product safety, which is known as CE marking. Now, for certain sectors, that was about textile. For certain sectors, about, for example, gems and jewelry. Now, gems and jewelry is something that comes in the contact of the skin. So, every country is very typical about the skin reactions coming out of like for example imitation jewelry is one of the most sellable item online every five seconds there is a uh, imitation jewelry that's been bought 
uh, through through these digital platforms now in order to connect with the b market where custom regulations will come into play every product has an import standard it is in terms of it is no pesticide because you know, it's not an eatable product but it's a gems and jewelry product so the the product that you are carrying on your body should not react with the skin of the consumers in that market and that reaction of the skin will depend upon the rate of nickel release must be less than 0.2 microgram per centimeter square per week the lots of internet addresses that can help you work out your plan of action in terms of the regulatory requirements of SPS and TBT let's come to the next standard which is your social standards so the two social standards that that helps you write a beautiful story is one is a fair trade certification which is basically uh helping you to gain a uh, confidence in the eye of a western buyer that you are enabling the community to improve its living conditions which would technically mean you see the fair trade label now this is a fair trade label where it is a certificate it is facilitated by a fair trade labeling organization which is internationally known as FLO and it ensures you you're technically trying to tell your buyers that you please come and buy from me because i am a more ethically conscious company and how do you how how is fair trade going to help you on that you're ensuring that if you are not a producer yourself you are a trader you procure this product from a producer but are you giving and sharing sufficient profit margins with the companies from where you are procuring this product and this in case of india becomes all the more concern of the international buyers because as a trader or as a merchant exporter we tend to earn a lot of margin for ourselves without sharing a lot of middlemen exploitation of the rural artisan in the handicraft sector is a similar example so when i start an handicraft export i'll be very very particular about getting a fair trade certificate which will ensure that you are pulling the customers to you because you have shared the profit margins back to the rural artisan and that gains respect in the eyes of the international buyers the other social standard is sa8000 where you are being audited uh by an external body and you get the certificate if you are giving your workers a very good working conditions right which technically talks about how you are treating your workers in terms of the benefits that you're giving them there's no discrimination between the male and the female no discrimination on the basis of religion or caste you are giving them a good working condition in terms of some csr activities in terms of the work culture in terms of the work environment then there is a concept which is coming up known as environmental standards which talks about two major standards which is foot miles and water footprint now suppose you are a factory located in noida you have two choices you can either use kandla port or you can use the jnpt port to enter the western side of the market now maybe for whatever reason despite the fact that kandla is much closer to you as compared to jnpt you choose jnpt port but then in that case the transportation miles that you have taken to reach your buyer becomes extremely extremely higher as compared if you would have chosen the shortest possible route so the companies have started asking for the certificate that right from your factory to reaching the factory of the buyer are you sure that you have actually transported a lot of fossil fuel and you have contributed to global warming so consumers are getting conscious and they need to know the miles from food to plate or from the factory to the final customers so how you using the shortest shipping distance becomes a competitive advantage for companies so if you have the certificate again it's a crowd puller for gains for the similar companies The next environmental standard that companies are bothered about is the water stress by 2020 there's a huge water stress that's expected right so the amount of water that you have used for in the entire manufacturing processes for example you are a new company you have a choice to start 
a leather business but you feel that despite the import duty advantage in an rta country despite the price advantages in our fta market i'm still not able to gain the attention of the consumers because the buyers are are very very cautious about these environmental standards the tanning processes uh in india is using a larger amount of water as compared to the competing countries of vietnam and china and that is the reason because of the larger water footprint the amount of water that i'm using is technically taking entire international market for me similar happens in case of rice in agriculture sector in rose cultivation and the rose products that indian rose takes almost 1 liter water every day as compared to hydroponics and aquaphobic techniques being coming out with chinese r&d and that is giving them an added edge the water footprint is another the environmental standards the final standard is a technology standard there is a new standard that has come up against the software piracy across the globe which talks about unfair competition act does it mean anything for indian companies yes it actually turns the table in the favor of indian companies as against china how now the the unfair competition act which is a uca law is an act in the us market which says that if a us company is found to be dealing with any company outside us which is found to be using a pirated softwares the us government will sue a us company so the priority of a us company goes in favor of doing businesses with international companies which are piracy compliant so we have to be very very cautious about these standards coming up in the international market and how does is give an added edge to the companies the only thing that you, the benefit cost ratio is very very high this means that i invest in getting my softwares a pirate a non pirated version i use those computers while dealing with the buyers in the us market and it actually converts the higher businesses as compared to china which is high, much more uh, uh working out in a much more uh, pirated version so that's another way to venture into an international market and you have immediate competitors in asia pacific region for example was australia bangladesh they found bangladesh 91% piracy so indian companies were losing out businesses for bangladesh because the products coming out of bangladesh was a least developed country and india being a developing economies so a lot of gsp treatments were being given to the bangladeshi products but if the percentage of piracy was found as 91% friends so the buyers priority in the us shifted in buying the similar products from indian companies as against bangladesh because of the ucl law so this finishes the plethora so i again repeat friends when you are entering into the export business finding buyers is an interesting process in sustainability of business is a much more interesting processes and attracting buyers sustainably with you becomes a much more interesting process friends so in this particular session we have learned various kinds of non tariff barrier so what was non tariff barrier the barriers which are not tariffs meaning import duty is not the reason of your barrier but something less than tariffs apart from tariffs it's a non tariff barriers what are all the different kinds of barriers we saw we saw the barriers can come in the kind of a quality barriers where your if you are an exporter of an agricultural product sanitary and phytosanitary measure can become a barrier to trade if you do not understand the import regulation of the food products in terms of food additives contaminants and the quality standards pesticides mrls you have likely to face rejections in the international market second standard that also applies to the non agricultural product is the technical barriers to trade the third kind of barriers that we understood was a social standard these are not custom barriers but they are also a good way to write a corporate brand story when you are entering into the market digitally as well then many countries are very particular about the environmental standards then we have ethical standards and finally we have technology standards so there are a plethora of public standards standards and private standards that a company should understand very categorically in order to 
make a successful entry into the international market.